Hello and welcome to this week's episode on how to be a great GM. Well, in continuing with last week's episode on how to run and start and write and create your very own campaign, we now move forward with our program on how to do it. So if you haven't watched last week's episode, I suggest you go and have a look at that first before we move on, because it does lay the groundwork from which we need to move forward forward, on, with, over, above, whatever, go watch the video. So we've now established the scale of our campaign. We've established the uh, parameters in which we're going to work. And to a degree, we've established the system and the style in which we're going to, to operate. What we now need to look at is and I'm, I'm looking at my notes here because there's a lot of them, we need to now establish the type of campaign that we're going to be running. Now, by type, I literally mean la grand theme, the theme, the main overriding story that's going to allow you to create what feels like a contained narrative within a chaotic space. Now, like the master plot, which gives you your singular direction from which you can deviate and move away from, but always come back to your type or your theme is going to be exactly the same uh, in terms of the functioning of it. So if we look at the different types or the different themes of campaign that you can run, you can run a war campaign, you can run a revenge campaign, you can run a justice campaign, you can run a, a, an ascension campaign, you can run a restoration campaign, you can run an apocalyptic campaign, uh, you can run a campaign that deals with the idea of uh, love, for example. So they're fairly broad ideals or ideas in which the narrative is going to sit. And this video is uh, not going to be particularly long because I really want to focus on the idea of this type. And we're going to look at how does type now help you in terms of coming up with your main campaign. So if we unpack type a little bit further, the idea of an ascension story, it's something rising from point A to point B whether it's the idea that the players are going to have the, well, the, the PCs are going to ascend from mortality to immortality. Is it that they are going to help a god become all-powerful? That's an ascension kind of idea. Is it a revenge story, in which case we are looking at something like The Prince's Bride, where we are trying to get revenge on acts and things that have gone wrong, and we see the revenge theme coming through time and time again until eventually we get to the end of the story. So they are broad strokes, and they are going to help you to focus. Now let's unpack how they do that. So let's look at, say, war. War is a theme that comes up time and time again, and there's a reason for it. It's got huge scope, and we can interpret it in so many different ways. We can look at the positive sides of war. We can look at the negative sides of war, which is what we usually do. We can look at what comes because of war. We can look at what leads up to war. The campaign I've just finished running with my players was the precursor to what happens once war has started. And how do wars start? And the PCs were ultimately responsible for literally launching the poor world of Braxia into global war. So if we look at the type war and we look at how it helps us, well, what we now do is we sit back and we say, right, war, that is our theme. That's our type. We are going for a, let's say, in terms of scale, we're going to go for, let's say, we're going to go for citywide. So this is going to be a locally based campaign. The characters, the PCs are constantly going to be coming back to a central point, And that is the point where our war type is now going to play out. All right. So we've got some, some good focusing now starting to, to happen. How do we then... 
how do we then move forward? Well, it's easy. Now what you do is you grab a piece of paper like I've got here and you start to plot out. If you can see that, you start to plot out all of the things that have to do with war as a theme. So just as you would in terms of a setting where you would say, well, what do players expect? You do exactly the same thing for your campaign type. What do we expect from war? Well, we expect grand combats. That's fantastic. We can have grand combats. We've decided that we're in a fantasy setting. We now want it localized around the citadel or castle or town, perhaps. We're not necessarily sure. That is part of the evolutionary idea in terms of nothing is fixed in stone as we, as we do this. So we're going to jot down mass combat. We're going to jot down a siege. Ultimately, the structure that the people are in is going to come under siege. It's a given. It has to happen. It's what we expect. It's going to come under siege. It needs to be abandoned. Everybody who's been fighting for this structure needs to, at some point, give it up. Then it needs to be retaken because if the theme is war around the city and we've decided that we want the conclusion to be a happy conclusion, the city needs to survive in one shape or form or another and our heroes need to be responsible for ensuring its survival. So they need to retake the city at some point. We have other things where we've got sabotage happening within the city, so the PCs have to find what's going on and stop that saboteur. When the war is in a lull, when perhaps the invading army has been driven back by the actions of the PC, the PCs might need to go and secure resources for the city. Perhaps there's a famine or a starvation that happens as a result of the siege or something else. The PCs now have to go out of the city to solve that. What if the PCs, though, decide that they want to leave the city? Well, that's where we've got to very quickly make sure that they remain part of the city. So we've got these, we've got siege, we've got famine, we've got um, sabotage, we've got mass combat, we've got, we've got a whole list of things that can happen. Now we need to look at how we're going to keep the PCs in that space. I would suggest literally on encounter three or four, adventure three or four, not encounter, adventure three or four, the PCs get made some kind of honorary protector of that citadel. They're given some kind of link. Even if you give them a tower for saving some component within the city, they now have a reason to stay and defend. Fill that city with NPCs that they love, and they will have even more of a reason to stay there. So again, the idea of that video on how to make NPCs that the players love, and how to make structures that the players love, those videos now start to come in, into play here. So if we then look at it, we say, okay, but well, we've got to set up that our players need to be invested in the city. So what videos, oh, what videos, what adventures are we going to give them to force that to happen? So we're going to start with the PCs in the city somehow. We've got to figure out something cool. And we've got to figure out how we're going to make those PCs start to become integral to the way that the city works, as well as make sure that they fall in love with the city. So we can look at things like, let's say, the city suddenly has a poisoned well, and it's the PCs who get hired to go and find the kobolds who are poisoning the well. That could be adventure number one. Adventure number two could be where there's an orphanage that's suddenly filled with strange zombie children and the players, the PCs, have to now go in and remove the curse of the orphanage and the orphans all club together and buy a suit of armor for the party or they buy them a sword or uh, they start to work for the PCs running little errands and things and so suddenly you have a little band of Orphans, which will run around and be all jolly and chipper and, well, howdy doody, sir, and I got you a blankie for when you go out hunting. All those sort of stories can start to build in. To get us to a point where the PCs are really in love with the city. It also means that there are certain adventures that we don't want to have involved. We don't want to have a corrupt leader of the city. We want our PCs to want to be there. So the leader of the city needs to come across as someone who's fair and just. Maybe they're harsh, but they are fair and just. And we need to establish that fairly early on. Now, what do I mean by establish that fairly early on? So now, whilst we are jotting down 
making a list of all of the potential adventures, all of the points that the players will expect to encounter in a war-themed environment, we can now start to build and we can start to see logical stories starting to come through. What we also do, though, is that we are also cognizant of the fact that we need an introduction, a middle and an end. So how does our grand story finish? It is, is it some kind of climatic showdown between the big bad who has now almost taken the city and the PCs who are now hugely powerful individuals who now defended and perhaps even sacrificed themselves to keep the city and those precious little orphans alive. So what's our big final moment? Now, generally with war, there are two outcomes. Either the big bad is defeated in combat, and it would be the PCs who are responsible for doing that, or there is some kind of truce, some kind of peace that is achieved and found. Generally, peaceful solutions are very tricky to make feel satisfactory. If you want to go for a peaceful solution to a war situation, or any situation where there's been mass and lots of combat, is have the big bad suddenly realize that perhaps they were wrong in attacking the city, and they should rather work with the city and share resources. But have a second lieutenant or somebody who works for the big bad who then betrays the big bad at the moment of signing those peace treaties and launches an attack so that the PCs can at least have some kind of violent resolution to this entire episode. And it will help it make it feel a little bit more worthy of having invested so much time in the long term campaign. So you've got to look at your conclusion. And you don't have to work out, oh, they'll be fighting on this battlement and there'll be this monster and there'll be that. Don't worry about that. We're talking broad strokes still at the moment. We are just listing maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 5. It doesn't matter. We are just listing a whole lot of potential adventure ideas. Ideas in potential. Adventures in potential. Something along those lines. We've also got to look at that narrative structure, beginning, a middle, and an end. So now we've got a list of different potential adventures that the PCs will possibly be expecting to go on, given that the type of the theme is war and that they are in this singular setting. Well, in the beginning, literally in the beginning, we need to know, we need to establish, and we now know this, we need to establish why the city is important to the PCs. We need to establish why there are NPCs in there that the PCs are going to care about. And we need to establish the fact that the PCs need to be based here. Now, you can't just say, all right, PCs, well, listen, this is a town scale environment, so I don't want you to leave. And part of your planning for this campaign should involve moments where the PCs have left. They've gone on some kind of errand. You must go and approach the king of the neighboring territories for aid. And whilst the PCs are out approaching this uh, individual for aid, they get news that the city is under attack. It gives them great tension to now have to get back to save the city whilst also making this peace treaty at the same time. So we work out what goes into the beginning of the story, the establishment of the characters and the establishment of the situation and the establishment as well, by the way, of the enemy. We don't just go into talking about World War II saying, well, there was the Battle of Dunkirk, and then there was the Battle of this, and there was a Battle of that, there was no Battle of Dunkirk, and, uh, but uh, there was this battle, and there was that battle, etc., etc., etc. We talk about, well, there were the Nazis who invaded this area, and then they invaded that area, and they wanted this, and they wanted that, and da-da-da-da-da, and then there was this force and that force who tried to fight back, and etc., etc. We need to establish the players in this entire space. So within the war type, we need to establish why the opposing army is now trying to take over the city. What has it done wrong? In the case of the city-states of Venice and Florence in the early days during the Renaissance period in Italy, what did they do wrong? Well, they sent the wrong size goose for Christmas and that insulted the one lord and so he decided to invade the other city because he could. Who knows? You need, though, to establish that. And your PCs need to be right in the middle of that. Don't fret. How are you going to get them there? But what you do is you create on your list of adventures PCs involved in starting war. Who started the war? 
Well, there was a general, or there was a king, or there was a this, or there was a that. Why did they start the war? Those questions we answer later. We get there. So now you've built your list of everything that happens at the beginning, in the middle. The middle is the meat of the story. This is where we have our big combats. Maybe that's what we are going to start with somehow. We're going to figure it out. But we're going to have our big combats. We're going to have our big moments. We're going to have our romance periods uh, happening in there where the PCs fall in love with NPCs. We're going to have betrayal. We're going to have sabotage. We're going to have expeditions elsewhere. We're going to have sieges. We're going to have all the, ma the majority of our stories happening in the I beg your pardon, in the middle, then we go to the end. In the end, we need to get it to the point where the PCs seem so far away from success, where the armies have completely encircled the city and there is no hope of salvation whatsoever, only then can we move into the end. And the end we've now worked out is either going to be a peaceful resolution with a twist with the villain um, as the second lieutenant or whatever the person's position might be, or we're going to have a violent conclusion with this epic massive battle that takes three sessions to play through. We are not going to that level of detail yet. We're still at the surface. So now we've got a fairly good spread of adventures that of adventure ideas, potential adventure, that uh, now form our campaign. Now we can sit back and say, all right, so now we've got a, an overview, a broad perspective of what we are going to be doing. Now we start to break it down into our master plots. And here's a tough question. Is the master plot the story that runs all the way from the beginning right the way through to the end? The answer is, it is entirely up to you. If you're going to run a campaign that's going to take a year or two years or three years, maybe you only need one master plot. If, however, you're going to plan on running a campaign that's five years or longer than that, I don't know if anyone ever does plan for a campaign that runs that long, but if you do, maybe you're going to need two or three master plots. But now you come to planning your master plot. You know what's got to happen at certain points. So by looking at that, you can have a, let's say your master plot is going to be the general who's commanding the army. Although I would say that that would be a very two-dimensional type of master plot because, well, the general who's commanding the army is invading the city. That doesn't give us a lot of meat with which to work. We need some layering to happen here. So the obvious big bad, the general who's leading the army, he might get assassinated by the PCs in Adventure 5. Who knows? Rather, step back and say, well, what starts this war? What begins it? Or, and this is the more important question, why is that city important? So we now look at it from the perspective of someone wants that city badly and is having difficulty getting it because the PCs are protecting it. Why do they want that city? Because once we know why they want that city, we'll start to be able to work out a much better master plot. Go watch that video if you, if you haven't looked at it yet, although I think I have told you enough times now to go and have a look at that. So with that in mind, we then might say, okay, well, what happens if it's actually not the enemies that are attacking the castle that want that particular castle, and the castle itself is not important? It's something underneath the castle, or something that the castle was built on top of. Or perhaps the castle is a confluence of multiple streams of magical energy, and the creature that is actually after it has influenced the general to start his attack and his invasion. Or perhaps the general has an alliance with this creature, this demonic power that causes this to happen. That starts to become a little bit more interesting. It gives us more layers. We've still got war as our type. It's still our main theme. We're still going to be drawing from it from all of our experiences of watching war movies and reading war books and watching war plays and all that kind of stuff. And actually there's a video on war and running a war setting if you want to go and have a look at that. But We've now got some layering starting to happen because we're now starting to build in our master plot into our type. Once you've got your master plot established, you can then say, right, so how is this individual or individuals, how are they now going to launch their attack against this castle? How are they going to achieve their objective? And then you look at what you need to establish up front. You need to establish the PCs in this town. 
So maybe the attack doesn't start in the first adventure. Maybe in the first adventure, the enemies who are not stupid have sent spies into the castle to start looking at defences. And the spies have been active and actively gathering information, but one of them slips up and a guard happens to have walked into a room to find the spy taking measurements of the walls or something. And the spy kills the guard. And the very first adventure is the lord of the castle asking the PCs to investigate the murder of this god. And that leads them to a spy who happens to have something that relates back to the foreign power. They don't know why the foreign power has sent someone through. And that leads us on to a completely different uh, mission because we, remember, need to incorporate our players, characters, backstories. And you can investigate those and take your time. Because now, no matter what the players have their characters doing, you know that once you have established a reason for the characters to be in love with the city, once you've given them property, and it doesn't matter how they get it, it doesn't matter that your main plot and that your campaign type is busy running in the background, how all of that unfolds can be as organic and as evolutionary, which is what we spoke about in the first video, as you like. There's no pressure, there's no force that you now need to impart, there's no railroad that you need to bring in. You just need to watch where the story is going, how it's unfolding, and occasionally drop in a hint that there's Oh, sightings of forests being cleared in the far north. Lots of forest, as if someone's building siege engines. Oh, who's building siege engines? There's an adventure. Go off and find who's building siege engines. Uh, an engineer has been abducted. Why? Because they need him to build a bridge for them over a particular river. Why are they building a bridge? So many adventures just roll off the little grey cells as we think about this campaign. And we've done very little in actual planning. When it gets to a point that we're comfortable that the players have their characters invested in the city, then we launch our first attack. We launch our grand entrance. And we can have that moment. We can build up to it beautifully because we've got the players doing all the little missions and things that they want to do and investigating side quests and, and etc, etc, etc. All that's doing is investing the PCs into our city. We then launch our first attack. The army surrounds. And now we start to move into the whole war space. And we can explore all kinds of things. We can really, really examine different aspects and different adventures that then come out. And we've got our list of potential adventures on hand. We haven't planned it beforehand. We haven't sat there meticulously working out all kinds of details. But we've been planting little things here and there. Doesn't really matter what it is. You can now sit back and say, all right, well, I remember about five adventures ago, they came across this person who did this. I need them to become aware that X is happening. I'm going to use this as a lead into that. That's all you do. And you just set it on its course and then you watch it happen and you go, all right, well, the players have now got to a point where they're a little bit smug, they're a little bit satisfied. Now we're going into the siege. And the siege, as you, if you watch the videos, the siege then is replete with a whole lot of different adventures that suddenly come out of it. And then, of course, we move into the finale after a year or two of playing and your players have thoroughly investigated and exhausted all of the options about the city. They've left it and abandoned it and gone to the neighboring kingdom. They've come back and retaken it. All kinds of things can play out and they can play out in your own time. So that is, in general, my approach to how I design campaigns. It's broad strokes confined by a few things that we as the audience, that we as GMs expect from that setting. And then it's a case of just watching it play out. Now, if you want to be more specific, you can plan a few little steps in advance. You can then break down those stories. You can then say, right, for this adventure, this is my big bad villain. And that villain is someone who's in the city who's working with the enemy. And then they eventually will overcome him. And then my next villain is going to come and get introduced and so on and so on and so on. So you can then start to really pigeon it down into very specific missions and into specific stories. 
I hope these two videos on how to run your campaign have been useful and insightful. And if you want to know more, if you feel that I maybe haven't covered a certain aspect of how I would do it, or if you want me to perhaps do a video where we do a whole campaign plan, which is pretty much what this video was, but it was very high uh, gloss sort of stuff. If you want it to be broken down even more, leave comments below. I do read them all, even though I unfortunately don't respond. There's just too many to do so. Um, let us know. Let us, let, us, let, us, let us work together to get even more out of this remarkable game that we all have. So you can join the conversation on um, how to GM on Twitter, uh, hashtag how to GM. You can come and find us on www.greatgamemaster.com where there's all sorts of weird and wonderful and cool stuff for you to uh, have a look at. And uh, until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. Thank you.